D.E. Vicordigalair, my name is James Nagel, welcome to The Irish Nation Lives. If you've been keeping up to date with the podcast, you'll know I've mentioned that between Arthur Griffith's by-election victory in late June and the general election in December of 1918, things go a little bit quiet in Ireland. Now, there are a number of different reasons for this. First, there are no further elections until December. Because of the German plot arrests, a lot of the leadership of Sinn Féin and the Irish Volunteers have been interned that is, imprisoned without trial, they were deported to prisons in England, and there they would remain until March of 1919. Also, at the start of July, Lord French, the Lord Lieutenant, issued a proclamation suppressing Sinn Féin, the Irish Volunteers, the Gaelic League, and Cumann declaring them as dangerous organisations, and public meetings now had to apply for permits to be allowed to go ahead. So, until November, I'm going to be doing a few pages out of Irish history episodes, where I take a step back from the events of 100 years ago. Today, I'm going to take a look at Home Rule. The accepted narrative is that John Redmond's party won an overwhelming mandate from the Irish people in 1910 to support the Liberals in return for Home Rule for Ireland. The Unionists were terrified of Home Rule and formed a militia to resist it, while the Nationalists formed a militia to enforce it, bringing the country to the verge of civil war. Instead, the First World War interrupted. Redmond called on nationalists to enlist and, by their sacrifice, secure home rule for Ireland, while unionists fought to prove their loyalty to the empire and show that they deserved exclusion from an Irish parliament. The 1916 Rising is blamed for scuppering home rule. In recent years, a former Irish Taoiseach, John Bruton, has said that had this not happened, home rule would have secured full independence for Ireland along the same lines as Canada. So here's an interesting question. What exactly is home rule? What would an Irish Home Rule Parliament have looked like? What powers would it have had? And more importantly, what powers would have been denied to it? Home Rule was an attempt by nationalists to find an accommodation for Ireland within the British Empire. Under the 1800 Act of Union, the Kingdom of Ireland and the United Kingdom of Great Britain had merged into a single political entity. The Irish Parliament was abolished and representatives now took their seats at Westminster. This union was largely supported by Irish Catholics and largely opposed by Irish Protestants, and if that seems unusual to you now, it made sense at the time. Roman Catholics were barred from sitting in the Irish Parliament. Attempts had been made to reverse this, but the Anglican-dominated body voted to maintain their grip on power. Catholics supported the union because they believed that they would be given the right to sit in Westminster. While they would dominate Ireland, they would make up only a minority of the United Kingdom Parliament they would get representation, while the interests of Irish Protestants would be protected. This group, however, saw things differently. The penal laws and their dominance of the Irish Parliament had allowed Protestants to concentrate power and wealth in their own hands. They had turned the northeast of the island into an economic powerhouse, while the rest of the country suffered under poverty and remained heavily agrarian. They formed the Protestant Ascendancy, a wealthy Anglican minority that controlled Irish politics, industry and law. The Act of Union would see them relegated from being the dominant rulers of the Irish Parliament to utter insignificance within Westminster. The Act was initially defeated in the Irish House of Commons, so the British Treasury had to be almost bankrupted to bribe the Irish Parliament into voting itself out of existence. The right to sit in Parliament hadn't been explicitly promised to Catholics as part of the Act of Union, but it had been hinted at. By the 1820s, however, they were still barred. So in 1823, Daniel O'Connell founded the Catholic Association to agitate for emancipation. O'Connell mobilised the masses of the Irish people and the Catholic Church into an effective publicity machine, and eventually, Westminster had to bow to the pressure imposed on it. O'Connell won a by-election in Clare in 1828, and the government feared civil war or another rebellion in Ireland should they deny him his seat, and the following year, a relief act was passed to allow Catholics to finally sit in Parliament. Following this victory, O'Connell set his sights on his next major goal, repeal of the Union. The repeal campaign called for the restoration of the Kingdom of Ireland and the pre-Union Parliament in Dublin with full control over Irish affairs. Ireland would have its own government, elected by the people and made up mainly of the newly emancipated Catholic elite. Queen Victoria would rule both the Kingdoms of Ireland and Great Britain in a personal union. O'Connell's new but familiar-looking political party, the Repeal Association, contested elections throughout the 1830s and 40s and staged a number of monster rallies, massive gatherings which were attended by over 100,000 people. This all terrified the British government, and they banned one such rally planned for Clontarf in 1843. 
O'Connell was urged to defy the British and go ahead with the meeting anyway, but he refused and called it off. This was a huge blow to the repeal campaign. Dissension broke out within the ranks of the association from which the Young Ireland movement would split off. O'Connell's health was failing, and repeal died alongside him in 1847. Black 47, as the year came to be known, was the worst year of the Great Hunger, the period between 1845 and 1851 in which one million Irish died from starvation and one million immigrated, setting in motion a population collapse which would begin to reverse only in the 1960s. The Young Irelanders staged a rebellion the following year in 1848, the failure of which led to the creation of the Irish Republican Brotherhood and the doctrine that only military force and complete independence from Britain could solve Ireland's ills. In the 1870s, Ireland's place within the empire was taken up again. It was clear that rule from Westminster had not been beneficial to the Irish people. Another famine was on the horizon and a land war was brewing, a period of mass agrarian agitation and violence. It was also clear, however, that repeal of the Union would not be acceptable to the British Conservatives or the pro-British Protestant population of Ireland so committed to the union they had originally resisted that they now self-identified as unionists. So, in the face of this, the concept of home rule was put forward, a devolved parliament with control only of domestic or home affairs. Isaac Butt founded the movement, and it was taken over on his death by Charles Stuart Parnell. In the vein of O'Connell, Parnell mobilised the support of the Catholic Church and used its structure to collect funds and promote the party. He joined forces with Michael Davitt, the leader of the Land League, and even gained support from the Irish Republican Brotherhood. The Home Rule Party quickly grew to dominate Ireland outside of the strongly unionist constituencies of the North East and Trinity College. The Liberal Party began to depend on their support to form governments, and this all culminated in a Home Rule Bill being put before the House of Commons, where it was defeated in 1886. The Home Rule Party split following revelations of Parnell's affair with a married woman, and he died in 1891 while campaigning to regain control of the movement. The Liberals put forward another bill in 1896 which made its way to the House of Lords, where it was easily shut down, and Home Rule lay dormant until the Liberals needed Irish support again in 1910. In 1900, the Home Rule movement had reunified under a compromise candidate, and that of course was John Redmond. In the years after propping up the Liberal government and supporting their reforms of Parliament, he would guide a Home Rule Bill onto the statute book, agree to its suspension on the outbreak of the First World War, and see it burned in the fires of revolution. It is this third Home Rule Bill that I am going to look at today. What I am going to do is go briefly through the 1914 text of the Government of Ireland Act. It's not a long document, but it's boring and couched in a lot of legal language. I'm then going to look at some comments Arthur Griffith made about the Act in 1912, when it first made its way through the House of Commons. Now, there is a difference between the Act Griffith read and the final Act that was suspended in 1914, but a lot has remained the same, and Griffith has some pretty good points about the major articles. Okay, so, the Government of Ireland Act, 1914. The first three sections deal with legislative authority. There shall be in Ireland an Irish Parliament, consisting of His Majesty the King and two Houses, namely the Irish Senate and the Irish House of Commons. Right off the bat, Section 2 sets out what the Home Rule Parliament will not have power over, and there is a lot here. Crown succession laws, treason, lighthouses. But the most important are probably Subsection 3, the Navy, Army or Territorial Force. Subsection 4, treaties or any relations with foreign states. Subsection 7, trade with any place out of Ireland. Subsection 8, any postal services that do not occur entirely in Ireland. Subsection 12 handles a number of reserved matters, which the Irish Parliament will have no power over. These include the Land Purchase Acts, the Royal Irish Constabulary, and the collection of taxes. Some of these reserved matters may be transferred to the Irish Parliament at a later point in time. The RIC will be transferred six years after the Parliament opens. However, there is no mention of the Land Purchase Acts or the collection of taxes. These will remain under full British control indefinitely. So now, on to the good stuff. The Upper House, the Irish Senate, will be made up of 40 members. The first 40 will be nominated by the Lord Lieutenant. They will sit for five years and then elections will be held. 
the Senate will sit for five-year terms and isn't affected by the dissolution of Parliament. The House of Commons will be made up of 164 members, and for the first election, the same rules as apply for elections to Westminster will be used. After three years, these can be changed by the Irish House of Commons, but this means that, for the first election at least, women will not be allowed to vote, nor will men who do not own or rent land over a certain value. Irish representation in Westminster will be reduced from 103 MPs to just 42. Control of finances is one of the defining measures of a nation, so as you can imagine, the section on finance takes up a large part of this act. And it's really boring. In brief, the proceeds of all taxes levied in Ireland, whether under the authority of the Parliament of the United Kingdom or of the Irish Parliament, shall be paid into the Exchequer of the United Kingdom. This becomes known as the Consolidated Fund. The Home Rule Act establishes a five-person joint exchequer board which will determine a sum of money to be transferred from this fund to the Irish exchequer, known as the transferred sum. The transferred sum consists of the proceeds of any Irish taxes imposed in Ireland by the Irish Parliament under the powers given to them by this Act. Okay, so... The Act gives the Irish Parliament very limited powers to create and impose new taxes or very existing imperial taxes. These will then be collected by British revenue agents and paid to the United Kingdom Exchequer, and then paid back to Ireland. So why not just keep the revenue in Ireland in the first place? Well, it's mainly a matter of control. It removes from the Irish Parliament the power to withhold any taxes or payments to Westminster. In a pamphlet on the 1912 text of the Act, Arthur Griffith says, In the case of a financial dispute between it and the British government, the British government will argue with the Irish government's purse in its pocket. The final major part of the Act is Section 41, Concurrent Legislation. If Westminster passes an Act that deals with an area the Irish Parliament has power over, or something already covered by an existing Irish Parliament Act, the Westminster Act takes force, and the Irish Parliament Act is declared void. Technically, the Irish Parliament doesn't even have power over the few areas it has power over. Griffith addresses this and declares simply that the power and authority of the British Parliament to legislate for Ireland will remain unaffected and undiminished after the Irish Parliament is established. He also points out that the British Cabinet could just direct the Lord Lieutenant to postpone giving assent to any act passed by the Irish Parliament. His assent is required for any act passed to take force. The Lord Lieutenant is appointed by the King, is paid directly by the United Kingdom Parliament, but Ireland contributes as well. He receives £5,000 from the transferred sum before it is handed over to the Irish Exchequer. The Irish Parliament can't even refuse to pay him as a form of protest. The pamphlet by Arthur Griffith I am referencing is a summary of an address he made on the 21st of April 1912 about the text of the Home Rule Bill. As is clear, this was amended slightly between 1912 and 1914, and would be amended further in 1916 and in early 1918 during the Irish Convention, but at that stage it was a dead duck. Griffith's criticisms are valuable in that he isn't a Republican or a militant force nationalist. He has put forward his own solution to the Irish question, a dual monarchy along the lines of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is basically repeal of the Union. He is a constitutional nationalist who is prepared to accept Ireland's position within the Empire. He would be happy to accept a good Home Rule Bill, but his criticisms deal with the utter powerlessness of the Parliament that would be created under the proposed legislation. Griffith also criticises the arguments that would be made by John Bruton 102 years later. The other British colonies, Canada included, have, as Griffith says, control over their own customs houses and their armed forces. If England attempted to exercise a veto on their acts, they could retort by increasing the customs duties on British goods and in the last resort by armed force. Ireland, he says, has no power to do any of this, to do anything other than pass a resolution of protest. These colonies are thousands of miles away, while Ireland is a two-hour sea journey. There doesn't seem to have been much of a discussion on this, but under Griffith's interpretation of the Act, the Irish Parliament will have no power over Irish agriculture. As I mentioned, the Land Purchase Acts, which gave loans to Irish farmers to buy their land from landlords, will remain under British control. 
Griffith reads this as meaning that the Land Commission will also remain under British control. The most expensive, the most inefficient, and the most important department in Ireland to its agricultural population is removed from the control of the Irish Parliament, and the British Parliament continues not only to rule over what the soil produces, but to hold in its keeping what the soil conceals. By which Griffith means all mineral wealth. Ireland will have no power to build mines to extract metals or materials. The terms of the Land Purchase Acts, he estimates, are set to run for at least another 80 years, with the final payments being made around 1992. Griffith's criticisms are made before even the Solemn League and Covenant has been signed, never mind the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force, and he makes no mention of potential Unionist resistance to Home Rule. The 1914 Act makes no mention of the exclusion of areas in the North. It references the power the Irish Parliament will have over Queen's University Belfast, and an attached schedule sets out how many MPs will be elected to the House of Commons from the six most northeasterly counties. The Act was to come into force for the entire island of Ireland as it was, alongside an amending Act which, when it was agreed upon, would exclude a certain amount of counties for a certain amount of time, so the Act doesn't deal with partition directly. Under the terms of the Government of Ireland Act, Ireland is denied an army or territorial force of any kind. It is not allowed to enter any type of relationship with any foreign nation, be it a British Dominion or not. Ireland will have no power over external trade into or out of the country outside of limited powers to regulate importation for the sole purpose of preventing contagious disease, and Ireland will have no power to design stamps or handle postal, telephonic or telegraphic communication other than that which occurs entirely within the island. Ireland may also be deprived of control of its agriculture. The Dublin Metropolitan Police will come under Irish control on day one, but the RIC, the police forces outside of Dublin, will remain under British control for six years. All taxation will be collected by British revenue agents and will eventually make its way back to Ireland after a number of deductions have been made which the Irish Parliament has no authority over. Irish representation in the British House of Commons will be cut from 103 to 42 MPs while it retains the ability to override acts of the Irish Parliament. And Ireland long a province be a nation once again. There are a number of massive problems with the Government of Ireland Act and a number of things its modern-day supporters conveniently overlook. Griffith argued that the Act would put Ireland in a worse position than it was without an Irish Parliament. The Irish Parliament was little more than an over-glorified county council, and in some areas it had even less power. We can never know what it would have been like to live under this heavily restrictive form of home rule, but I can't imagine it would have satisfied the people of Ireland at large. As time went on and Irish legislation was invalidated, as the powerlessness of the Parliament was displayed, would the people have apathetically accepted their lot in life? Sinn Féin had been growing in support at local elections over the past decade, would they have been able to win seats to this enlarged parliament and either abstain or obstruct proceedings? The Republican movement and the Irish Republican Brotherhood wouldn't have just disappeared. They may have been weakened in the early years after Home Rule, but the parliament would have served as something else for them to infiltrate. They could showcase its dependence on Britain to gain support and justify their campaign of militant force maybe even directing attacks against the Parliament itself. There are no guarantees as to what would have happened, but it is highly unlikely that this would have served as a final settlement to the Irish question, never mind the fact that I haven't even discussed the North. Is there anything to be said in favour of the Government of Ireland Act? Not much. It's the first piece of legislation to grant devolved powers to any part of the United Kingdom, so it is possible that in time more powers would have been devolved to Ireland as it proved its loyalty and its ability to handle itself. An argument can be made that the 1931 Statute of Westminster, which officially ended the powers of Westminster to legislate for its dominions, would have granted the Irish Parliament the same powers as Canada and the Irish Free State Iraq this got. There is no guarantee, though, that the devolved Irish Parliament would have been included under the Statute of Westminster, and this reimagining of the Empire was in part down to Ireland's struggle for independence. The biggest factor, though, is that it would have cemented the limited powers 
in the hands of a relatively small group of Irish politicians, and it would have opened, to them, a greater involvement in the affairs of the empire. Daniel O'Connell had promised that, if treated fairly, the Irish were ready to become a kind of West Britons, dedicated and loyal to the regime. This Irish Parliament, for its own survival and the survival of its governing class, would have been charged with maintaining and promoting this Britain-centric view, declaring that Ireland was a constituent nation of the Union, which sought only its rightful place within the Empire. How would the Irish language, a Celtic revival, and Gaelic games have been treated when a Parliament ran on this mindset? So, what do you think? Could Home Rule, as described here, have led to an independent Ireland like we have today, just with a Queen instead of a President? Was the 1916 Rising and the Irish War of Independence unnecessary, unjustified? Or are these limited measures the most Ireland could have hoped to have achieved without resorting to violence? I'd also like to know what you think a Home Rule Ireland would have looked like. Would the lives of the ordinary people have improved, and what would have happened to Irish culture and the Irish language? There are more Pages Out of Irish History episodes planned before we get to the end of the First World War and the general election in November and December, and I have a couple of episodes planned for January, but that is all a long way off yet. Make sure to check out the Irish Nation Lives Twitter and Facebook pages. There is also an Instagram page that I'm kind of using. All links are in the description. Check out Twitter in particular. I'll be tweeting there about the events of 100 years ago and retweeting articles on the time period. If you have any questions on this episode or suggestions for a future one, you can post them there as well. Accordia, thank you for joining me on The Irish Nation Lives. Slong of old.